was that? Oh, my God.
You hear me? Are you? Hi, Jan. Can you hear me? Wait, hold on. Let me see if my sound is off. Uh, hold on. No, it's, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Can you can hear me? Good. Hi, everybody. Hold on, I'm going to go off screen. I need to set up a second computer to take notes. Give me a sec. Uh, okay. Oh, my gosh. You recovering, Haya? Yeah. It's okay. That was quite a day. Sure was. How about how is your back, Ellen? Horrible. Oh no. Did you pull it or something? Did you put it out or something worse? You know, um, I think it's kind of been disintegrating a little and then I must have done something. So um, I have to get an MRI so that they can locate the spot to do a shot. Oh, um, okay. So. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. No, sorry as I am. <laughs> Yeah. I'm supposed to be working on pulling up all those flags on Monday. I'm not going <laughs> to, it's going to be a little they're hard. Them up? They're going to pull them up. Yeah, they're all done. It, 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 uh, Sunday is, the, if you want to see it, I think it ends Sunday night. Okay. Didn't know that. I saw it at the armory, but it's gotten bigger. It's insane. Yeah. Oh, wait, what's the it? Oh, the um, COVID, the flags to those who have passed um, oh, okay. COVID on the National Mall. Got it. It's on the mall now? I went to it when it was in the armory. Yeah. I met the, the lady. It was really amazing. Yeah, yeah it's on the mall. Wow. That doesn't sound like a good thing for your back, Ellen. <laughs> well, I've, I kind of organized some people to go, so I need to go. I don't know. I, I may just be. Yeah. Making supervising. Me Telling them what to do. <laughs> I was supervising. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Back injuries completely suck. They're just. Yeah, I know. I want to just put that out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been lucky so far. So unfortunately, and then I, um, Sunday, I missed a step. Oh, it's walking off like a curb and I miss I didn't see it uh, like, uh, really I mean it didn't cause additional damage it just really okay let's um let's um begin let me just do a quick roll call um I Jan yes she's here Julie Abrams present uh Julie Greenberg present I don't think I saw Julie here. okay we don't know yet Ed I'm here. Julie Greenberg is here. Did you oh, okay. rework? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Susanna? I'm here. Haya? Yeah. And Brian? Boarding for duty. Okay. <laughs> and I met two people in person for the first time the last couple of weeks because of town events, which is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and Ellen. Okay. We're all here. Great. Um, Neil is here with us. I believe I saw him. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he's going to give us a, a report on the progress and the um, that he's made in terms of mapping out the, um, the town. So, um, Neil, would you? Um, is Neil Weinstein? Maybe if people can go on mute because I'm hearing echoes. Yeah. If you're not speaking, Neil um, Weinstein, of the Low Impact Development Center. And can everybody put their uh, computer on mute except for Neil? Thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks, Greg and Jenny may join us from Rain Plan. I think that 
small kids, so they might have some uh, babysitting issues. Uh, so uh, let's be the only one here from the group working on the project. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. So I think um, some of you have seen this presentation. Uh, and I'll go through it. Uh, Jenny's there. It's great. And um, and so Jenny and I will give the presentation. It's about 15 minutes and uh, give you some background. And then we'd like to open it up. And um, I got the chance to come by on Sunday and see the tour and call it, you know, five or six houses. So that was really helpful, actually, to talk to some of you. Um, so let me just share the screen. Everyone see that? Great. So let me just bring this and start it up again. I'm not sure if you can uh, maximize the screen on your computer. Um, it may be slightly bigger than for some of us. There, how's that? Yeah, I guess that's fine. That's how this yeah. Yeah, let me just move this over a little bit. So, um, so I'd like to just give you a quick agenda, general objectives of the plan, some background, some data sources, and some base mapping uh, demonstration of the approach. And then we'll talk about the integration of range plan. So just to give you some background, um, you can see over here, this is, I think, uh, 1945, how Somerset looked. Uh, Dorset Avenue, about half full. And you can see here, most of the town is undeveloped. Uh, we like to bring up old USGS maps because we look and we want to see historically where um, old streams are, because especially in older uh, neighborhoods or places, there's a lot of springs. Can people please mute if you're not presenting? Thank you. And um, and wellheads, which cause uh, can cause wet basements and wet lawns. Um, so there's nothing that really goes up the center. Uh, we, we thought we had a one, um, which could have explained where the screen line is. Uh, um, but that's just an old trail. So you can see a little falls parkway and you can see the stream moving over time, uh, just going back and forth a little bit. This hill is pretty steep, so it's not going to have much ability to cut into the slopes. And you can see one of the really cool things about uh, that we noticed is when we opened up the JS and looked at the tree canopy here on the lower right, you know, the entire town is really almost under the tree canopy. Um, Reading previous reports, uh, you can see that there's, uh, and reports that your group did, uh, there's really well established, established tree canopy, which is great. And you can see here back in the 70s, uh, when a lot of the houses were built, being built, I guess in the 60s um, and 70s, you can see the difference in the tree canopy between the older sections of town and the newer sections of town. And we also mapped out where um, Rainscapes uh, projects were. And uh, it's a little jumbled because of the symbols uh, that are used. But you can see, you know, you, there are some participation. And um, like I said, it was interesting talking to a few of you on Sunday on how you kind of went about it and how you went to design things and the reasons for putting some of the Rainscapes in not just aesthetics or conservation, um, but to really help some of the water problems. And so because we're doing this with GIS, it's a little bit different. We're going, and this will tie into the Rainscapes program uh, a little bit. We kind of bought up all the properties in the town. So you can pick an address, uh, let's say 4708 Drummond, and we can tell you the lot area uh, the amount of imperviousness, the amount of tree canopy, the amount of roof area, and that the lot has open space on it. So um, this will be part of the deliverables is that we'll give this to you. It's just a simple spreadsheet. Uh, there's a bunch more columns to it, um, but it's useful for us in some of the planning work uh, that we're doing. So for example, we can look at Somerset and look at how much of the imperviousness by type 
um, because the hard surfaces are what generates runoff off the property. You can see building is about 25 acres and roads are predominant. Uh, patios are very small amount. Non-street sidewalk are very small amount. Um, and then there's some identified. But most of the uh, buildings, besides the roads, um, buildings really take up a lot of the property. Um, can I just, I, I think there's weird feedback. I don't know if it's your mic or. I think there's someone who's not muted and I, I wrote a note, but it didn't respond. Maybe I'll text her. <laughs> anyway. but, but Neil is less clear than anyone else for some reason. Yeah, I think it might be his mic. There's like a lot of noise. I don't know. I've been on two or three calls today. Let me see if that works. Does that work? If I'm going to have to get out of this. It's going to take a couple minutes. Neil, this was the same issue at the council meeting. Your voice is just muffled. Okay. Let me so you may want to put the microphone super near your mouth, which is looks funny yeah. or feels funny, but works feels fun as well. <laughs> no, but it's not going to go on because I have a mic of another source. So uh, bring the screen up. Neil, while you're doing that, I, I, I have a question. Is, where, where does the data um, for the amount of impervious surface on each lot and the extent of the tree canopy on each lot come from? The data, that's the Montgomery County GIS information. So you can go to the county website and you can also do this research. It will pull it up for you by... Uh, it won't pull it up for you, but you can um, get the basic statistics about your lot size and everything like that. All right, and that and that's that's pretty up to date and and accurate. That's uh, uh, probably most of the data is two or three years old. Okay, but relatively. Um, I have a question. So, first of all, you're much clearer now, Neil. So that's good. Okay, um, is this better? Much better. Um, okay, great. What is the air, total area of Somerset? Like, how much? What's this? How does? How much does this represent in, in total uh, area? Well, this is the total. Uh, I guess the total area is about fifty some acres. I, I don't know right off the top of my head because it, it the, this. Um, oh no, it's more than that. This is just the impervious area. I, I'll exactly. have to look. Exactly, it it's up. just the impervious area. I'm just trying to figure out what the total area is. Just curious. Uh, I'd have to bring up the spreadsheet and tell you exactly what it is. Okay, no problem. Sorry about that. And then we looked at, we use those statistics to start looking at uh, the percentage of imperviousness. For example, the number of properties um, that have over between 30 and 35% imperviousness is about 100 um, and then it steps down. So you can see the type of, we're trying to find out how, how dense the compacted soils and, and the imperviousness are. And um, then we can look at non-roof imperviousness. So just um, a number of properties that besides the roof have, you know, five to 10% in, you know, pat in patio or driveway. So this kind of just tells us some somewhat a little bit about, we can predict some of the um, uh, density of the lots and therefore the potential for runoff. Then we also took the survey um, that you had prepared, the group had prepared, and we translated that off to um, the maps of the um, individual property. So if someone responded, there was significant flooding, it was in magenta. And then um, if they didn't respond or complete the survey, on, uh, it's in this light blue. But you can see their, their areas, we'll look in a minute and see why some of these are uh, magenta colored that we predict. Um, usually when you do a watershed survey, 
I mean, a watershed plan, um, everything is kind of lumped together and as one big drainage area or several. And what we did is because we have this good data, uh, we're able to create little micro watersheds uh, that we can study. And we kind of took a combination of where people responded that they had water problems. And we looked at how it was done uh, in the context of the lots. So you can see this like light blue here. So each, each one is just where the colors don't really mean anything except just to differentiate the watersheds. So for those of you, everybody's familiar with that term, watershed. Um, Nat, Nat, can you explain what that is? I'm sorry. Sure. So what a watershed is or a catchment is usually all the water that kind of you have, I'll show you this picture here is a better definition. Usually I have a high point and a low point or a point of discharge, which could be a stream, a lake, a, uh, a drainage inlet. Uh, in this case, you can see there's a, this little circle here is a, a small inlet as a high point. So everything within that catchment area kind of flows to one central low point. And so we have a high point. So what we did is we looked at the topography from the GIS and we looked at these water, small watersheds and said there's a high point and then a low point and then there's areas you can see in the, the pink or magenta colors where there were drainage complaints. And usually these are gonna follow at the bottom of the hill or other areas that are receiving water. That answer your question a little bit better. And then finally, what we've been doing is we've been walking around uh, the neighborhood. Now for the master plan, we're gonna probably make very generalized. Um, we, we, we don't really have the time or budget to go through all 440 some properties. So we're gonna pick one or two of these watersheds, these micro watersheds and make very specific uh, recommendations to demonstrate the approach. Um, one of the challenges we have is that we, we don't always have access to some of the backyards. Um, and so we're taking this off of the aerial or kind of from our um, field investigation. So it's not always um, gonna be super accurate, but the idea is what we wanna convey is how can we large scale implement some of these practices and how could we even create some shared facilities or facilities that work together, such as clusters of rain gardens uh, near properties or soil amendments or conservation landscaping and planting. So the next steps that we have, um, we wanted to really wait till we had this meeting to get some feedback and some input is um, we should, I think we have maybe just a little bit more to do in the field evaluations, uh, verify our assessments and the field evaluations verify this desktop assessments that we did. Um, we were gonna uh, look at potential code and ordinance changes that could help reduce some of the flooding and water quality issues. Uh, draft, final draft, and then a complete master plan. And then uh, the next step will be integration with the rain plan. Anyone have any questions so far? Just a quick one. Um, do, did everybody get these slides or is... Um, Matt has a copy of it. I distributed to him. So, okay. Um, I have a question. Um, in terms of the videos, um, people were supposed to send the videos to or send their email to Haya, and then Haya was going to um, send them to you, and you were going to send an invitation for people to send them individually. I was wondering, I don't think I've gotten an invitation to send it. So I didn't know where we were in that process. Cause oh, I think there I, was, are, I have several videos. I, I assumed that Neil wanted me to wait and give him a whole list all at once. Yeah, give, give me a whole list so I, we can send yeah. out a batch email to everyone. And yeah, yeah, that's okay. what I figured. So I'm actually, Ellen, I, I some people said uh, that they never got a request. So I, I want to send out a special thing on Friday with the blast. 
to okay. tell. I think people just are unclear. Like it's been inside of other emails, but people haven't noticed it. So I'm going to send it out one more time. And I think um, some people were trying to send it to Matt. So I think we do need to make that a little clearer. But uh, Neil, what is what is your you know kind of drop dead date? I know you're kind of finalizing and looking at properties. So when is when should we just say that's it and send you what we have? Um, it would be good, you know, through middle of next week would be if that's okay. Yeah, um, so I just I, need, I'm going to. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just need everyone's email who's going to submit something. And hopefully it's not like 200 people. Um, so far, I have four. But I think I think that, again, that people didn't really get the message. So I'm going to send out a special note on Friday. And then I assume over the weekend, and that'll be it. Yeah, you know? so that would be great. And, yeah. and if we give people a cutoff date of Monday or Tuesday, if you're sending it out yeah. the weekend, then we can kind of start to some of the issues a little bit more and wrap wraps okay before i hand it over to jenny thank you jenny you want to pick it up sure um hi my name is jenny janice i work with rain plan um i am uh my title's team lead of ecosystem but that just that means that I, I coordinate closely with designers and installers um, to get our projects, to get property owners connected to um, people to build their projects. Um, also helping with uh, strategy on um, connecting people to incentives as well. I don't see, uh, Neil, can you put, bring up the presentation? Sure. Okay. Do you want me to just do each slide? Yeah, let's do it the same way we did before. Yeah, just tell me when to move it. And okay. I'll move it for you. Greg Canito is our founder. He typically does this presentation. So hopefully I can um, present it as well as he does. So um, I think I think you've all been introduced to 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 the kind of the general idea of, of Rain Plan. And I recognize some of you from the first in, the first presentation that we did. Um, we are a, as it says, an online marketplace for stormwater incentives and financing. Um, our mission is to advance the adoption of green infrastructure. We are really stormwater enthusiasts. And um, we are trying to bring to the online um, world uh, something that is very you know, tactile and, and physical. And so that, that is our challenge. Um, we're very excited to work with Somerset um, as, a, as a community that is, has, um, wants to take charge of its uh, stormwater management and through a collective effort, um, initiate projects that, that make sense. So as it, as it reads here, functionally, we, we would, the way it would work is someone would enter in their address and we've built an incentive database uh, where then the address is analyzed through the kinds of public information we can find through aerials and, and GIS information. Um, and then that property is shown the incentives that are available to them. Um, so there is a, um, a, a a decision the homeowner can make where they can say that's great information. I I like those. I would like to do those incentive to use these incentives to build X, Y, or Z, and they can do that themselves, or they can use our service to help them along with that process. We create a situation where we have a uh, platform for the homeowners to um, guide themselves, and and we have a rain planner that is assigned to each property. That helps the homeowner decide what are the um, kinds of BMPs and incentives that make the most sense for this their situation. Um, if there is a desire to do financing, we also have the ability to help finance any projects in addition uh, above the, what the incentives might provide. Um, we are also uh, networking actively with qualified contractors. I talk to them daily, trying to find 
folks and, and figure out who we want to include in our, in our system so that as projects do come to the table, we are connecting people to qualified contractors that know how to build these systems. Um, and, and then, you know, as part of the Somerset Master Plan, we're, we're offering this as, as our um, service. There's a property owner dashboard. Um, and, and Neil, if you want to go one more slide. So we really have, we, we, we kind of group, we serve four types of participants and we group it as the incentive value and the property value. So we're working closely with municipal agencies to figure out how to get voluntary participation from the private sector. As we all know, stormwater management is an incredibly massive undertaking at the public infrastructure level. And what they've found is that it's actually less expensive in the long run to incentivize private um, properties to develop these kinds of systems on their property. It's, it's, it's the idea of the little, every raindrop adds up, right? Or every snowflake adds up. So instead of having to build massive new gray, what's called gray infrastructure, um, pipes and things under existing city streets and towns, um, there is a, municipalities are searching for a combination of those solutions where they are still upgrading their gray infrastructure, the pipes and the, and the typical way that things are managed to the, um, to the you know, uh, complementing with green infrastructure, which is the, is the BMPs that we're talking about, rain gardens, conservation plantings, permeable pavers, um, green roofs even. Uh, so we, there was a question I saw that just came in about Montgomery County Rainscapes Program. So, so we, we're um, actively um, partner, partnering with them. And what we do is we're basically helping to connect homeowners to those incentive programs. So when you would go in and, and search your property, you would find all of the Montgomery County Rainscape programs that you could apply for. That's that your property could qualify for. And then we take it a step further by saying, come, you know, we have a consultation with a rain planner. We'll look at your property. We'll look at the incentives you're interested in. And we'll have a conversation about how you might want to go forward. Um, so that's how we're, 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 we are acting as the connection point. Um, Neil, do you want to go one more? And so in particular with the Somerset project, we're really, it really demonstrates how we're thinking at two scales. Um, stormwater is something that it's kind of like the think globally, act locally kind of idea where you look at your near neighborhood holistically, right? But the, act, the actions are taken on individual properties. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the community maps that Neil and his team have developed, you can see the watersheds that they figured out and you can see the, the little pink arrows that show the stormwater, how it flows within those watersheds from the high points, which are represented in, by the red dots and the blue points, which are, red, are the low points. The blue dots are the low points. So this, this is something that we're gonna have on our dashboard for residents of Somerset to look at. And, and then you can click on a property and then see a, um, this, uh, a water calculator where you can look at how much water at the top left falls on your, your um, property. And uh, we, we changed it from 1.2 inch storm to one inch storm. How much of your property is retaining that storm water just by having the pervious surfaces that you have, so the, so the lawn, the landscape, and then how much can you retain in addition to that by adding certain things like a rain garden, a green roof, permeable paver. And then um, all of that is by using GIS information where we get lot size, we have the amount of impervious surface on that lot, and then we can figure out based on that some, some high level numbers for, for how stormwater you know, what volumes are, of stormwater are falling on your lot. So it's just really an education tool um, for property owners to kind of start to grasp the amount of water that, um, 
their lot is is um, is falling on their lot and 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 hopefully incentivize them or encourage them, I should say, to to take action if they can, if they have a situation where it makes sense. So again, um, we're really we're I. I we're really excited to work with Somerset because of, of all the work Neil and his team have done. And it really tees up a situation where we might be able to complement um, some of the, some of the um, actions that community members in Somerset want to take. I see another question. Let me look at this. Do the current GIS and aerials recognize permeable pavers as permeable and not impermeable? That's a really good question and no, they don't. So um, that would be, the only way that it would recognize that is if the agency that's entering the information has that, that information and, and codes it a different way. So I think for permeable pavers, if you have them, your lot is, um, it's probably considered impervious according to GIS. Um, so I only had, I really only had three slides. I, I kind of wanted to just introduce the, um, if you go to the first slide, Neil, there's pictures on the left that show you how we're, we're trying to set up um, our, our dashboard and you can see, you know, we're making the, the tools that we're providing available on mobile. Um, the middle picture shows the incentives listed and how those incentives are um, dispersing funding. And so someone can go through and kind of choose which one they're interested, with, interested in um, schedule a call with a rain planner. We can go over their selections and their properties and then figure out if that homeowner wants to move forward with us or, or do something on their own. So that, that concludes um, what I wanted to present. If anybody has any questions, I'd love to answer them. Yeah, um, one observation I made uh, kind of on Sunday and, and talking to a few people was also um, how people were kind of cooperating in a couple of situations um, where one property was picking up some other drainage or diverting it or their drains. It seems there's a lot of drains that go from downspouts out to the curb um, in a couple of things. And um, that's one thing that we'd probably wanna talk uh, because when we start talking about codes, um, usually it, it's, it's a nice thing that people let you cross over their property lines with a drainage improvement, but let's say your neighbor, um, changes their mind or, mm -hmm. uh, uh, decides that they don't want to, or someone new moves in, then it's hard to maintain certain, you know, those characteristics. So that, that's something we have to kind of chat out about with the, um, when we start doing the code review. There was a question um, on chat that says, is all the funding from public funds? So all of the incentive funding is from public funds. Um, we are also working with um, uh, groups like the DC Green Bank to try and secure um, low cost loans for folks who might wanna do something that requires a bit more of an investment. For example, we've done a, um, some green roofs in the in DC, um, and are finishing up some of those projects now. And mm -hmm. have yeah, oh yeah, this one. Sorry, I forgot about this last slide. Um, this is an example of of a recent project of ours where they are are getting permeable pavers installed, um, and they also have uh, installed a green roof. I think it's roughly two thousand square feet. Um, Greg knows the numbers of, of the amount that they got funded, but it, it's escaping me. Um, I want to say it was like between 20 and 30,000 that they had an incentives and then the roof cost maybe 50, something like that. So then, um, you know, they funded the other 30 through us. Yeah, it, it seems in some of the designs, just kind of walking around, 
people just didn't plop a rain garden down or some tree planting. It was integrated into a landscape or part of a bigger um, picture, which was great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we know it's, a, it's the, some of the rain gardens, um, the soils from what we can tell, Somerset has some clay soils that might be kind of challenging. Um, so we'd have to figure out, you know, how to lot by lot and case by case get um, percolation tests done to measure the infiltration rate. That's a requirement for the incentive. And um, so there's there is some we, we definitely have to follow the 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 river um, smart requirements because um, we our our goal is to meet the, meet those right. program goals um, and that's how we need to get our mission is to get the incentive funding so to do that we have to have the final inspection approved and and get the project approved before install yeah so um yeah rainscapes you dc's um river oh, there's sorry yeah rainscapes I'm there's, just there's rain check rebate too there it's hard to keep them all straight yeah it is um there's a bunch of stuff coming in let me see um <clears throat> I did see that Somerset was a rainscape neighborhood um, and that their the houses had been evaluated. Um, I looked at the data that I could find online for that. Um, I don't know exactly. I think the, they just decided to stop the, um, the program. And we, we looked at the report. There was an early draft of it that we had. Um, and it was really focused on kind of individual houses and not necessarily looking at the contributions of runoff from other properties or the impact of those properties on kind of downhill or downstream owners. It was, you know, you could put a rain garden in your front yard or permeable paver and not really looking at a more of what the localized impacts were for that. Mm -hmm. Um, if anyone has other information about that Rainscape Neighborhood effort, I'm sure Neil and I would love to, to hear it. Um, the, there's a question about DC Green Bank. I would have to defer sources of financing questions to our founder, Greg. He's, he has been focused on those, those conversations. So if you, if you would like to know more about that, um, uh, definitely just shoot Neil or um, myself an email and I can, I'll just put my email in here. Uh, change this to everyone. Uh, we do, we do charge a fee. I would love if our work could be for free, but, but we, we are trying to run to do a business, make a business out of this. So we, our, the way we're setting it up, as I explained, is the process of entering your address and finding what incentives are available to you is completely free. Um, and so homeowners can choose to do the incentive program on their own if they want. Um, they can even finance it through us and do it on their own. We, we have we we have a flexible we have a flex flexibility there. If if a homeowner's just busy, they want to do the program, they want to do the project, they want the incentive, but they don't wanna take the time to figure out how to meet all the requirements, upload the documents, get the contractor, um, then we would charge a small percentage of the final incentive. So um, our that ensures that, you know, our, we are motivated to meet that incentive program because we don't get paid unless the you get your final incentive from that program. So, um, so go ahead, Neil. You say yeah, I just was going to say if you were finished, someone asked about green roofs. Okay, um, I see. What is the lead time for funding? I don't know that answer either. Follow up with me, and I'll 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 get Greg um, involved. Uh, green roofs. We have not been sued. Are they practical? Maybe just some stuff. Well, this is one of those 
it depends on who you ask uh, if they're practical or not. Um, they, they, we have targeted um, installers who have been building green roofs. We have one uh, installer in particular who has been building green roofs for, for over a decade. Um, he has helped create um, the product for some, one of the bigger commercial green roof installers located in Baltimore. And he's now out on his own trying to develop his company. And he's a very excited to work with us because he's been trying to work with re residential homeowners. And that's just been a, a difficult market for him to break into. So working with us, he sees a, he sees a, a really great synergy. And that's what we're mm -hmm. trying to do is help facilitate these builders who are passionate about green infrastructure get this more work. Yeah. Um, so it, it's really dependent to on your structure when it was built. Yeah. Um, because if it's not, uh, because there is some added weight to the roof, although it's not a huge amount, um, you have to demonstrate that it's structurally able to carry that load. And, and, and that's where uh, probably the bigger cost is. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just tell you that you have to get a, so the incentive requirement is to get a structural engineer to analyze your, your roof. Um, they will look at it and figure out what the weight, how much weight you can, you can hold on it. Um, if it's an existing roof that you are not replacing, then we have to get someone out there to verify that it is water tight. Um, and then the green roof installer can come on and, and, and build. And that's after we look at like a, the, the amount of slope that you have on the roof. So, um, I think we can do up to 20 or to 30% slope um, with certain, um, there's a certain system that you can put in place. Uh, so, so it's definitely an option um, but it is it is out of all of the BMPs, it's the one with the long the longest process because you have to involve um, a few contractors to do it right. Thank you. I tried to unmute myself. Thank you. You're welcome. Is that um, is that the end of your presentation, Neil? Oh. Yes. Okay, great. Um, does uh, any kind of discussion questions? I, I have one question for Neil. So Neil, you mentioned that um, one of the projects or, or within your portfolio, the things you're going to be doing is working on proposed legislation. I think. Um, I think that's how you would describe it. Can you maybe share with us your thoughts on the parameters that you would be so, sharing? Yeah. With? So maybe one would be, you know, a lot of times when people do improvements to their homes, they'll take their downspouts and direct them towards other properties or empty them towards, you know, you don't have 200 feet between houses. You're pretty close. And so, you know, a, a code amendment to the code would be, you know, direct downspouts or have a level spreader or connected to the street, um, right? Uh, you may want to look at how do you, um, because, you know, a swale or a berm or a pipe doesn't necessarily follow the property line. So if it provides benefit to a couple of houses, <laughs> Do you, uh, you know, have an easement or right of entry, mm -hmm. right? So someone can maintain, I think um, uh, those are the kind of issues you, you want to maybe propose. Uh, and, and you may want to look at capping some impervious cover on your lots above and beyond uh, what the county is. So I've seen, for example, I was working on a project in um, Howard County, where if you did any additional pavement or decking, uh, you had to store an inch of water somewhere. And like in a cistern, that's what we designed or uh, have very um, soils that are very, 
they're they're kind of all over the place it looks like but for the most part uh they hold a lot of water near the surface so you may not be able to really do that practically because it won't infiltrate into the ground so there's a couple things that you know we put on the table i think it's part of our scope we're supposed to sit down with the town attorney and come up with the, some of these and, and look at the implication to do under your okay. code. You know, we're, we're not attorneys, so um, it's a really legal construct. It sounds like that, that would be very helpful. I think, um, you know, this may not be the right time to have that conversation, but, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we think about, but, um, and we, we spent a fair amount of time already thinking about um, potential statutory programs, um, changes that we would put in, uh, 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 you know, amendments to our, our town code that would specifically target um, stormwater. And so far, they are, they're really all, everything we've been thinking about is focused on new development or new construction of some kind to an existing, uh, to an existing property. And I think one of the things that would be helpful, and it seems like given your expertise and experience, you may be helpful with this, is to understand how big of an impact can we expect to make on our significant stormwater problems by targeting future construction. And, you know, I'm thinking, um, you know, because I, I think that's something that we need to have a feel for in deciding what are we going to impose on property owners, um, how big an impact are we gonna have? So we have big stormwater problems um, already, a, you know, code provisions targeting new construction aren't gonna make, you know, probably aren't gonna make the existing problems better. They're, they're designed to prevent new construction from making the existing problems worse. And I think it'd be helpful to understand how big of an impact can we have if hypothetically all we were to do was to target new construction. And I'm not looking for an answer right now. I'm laying the issue out there and suggesting maybe we can have a conversation about that. Well, I, I can give you a quick answer, um, what sure. you're thinking about. One is if you're impacting the drainage from an adjacent property, um, let's say you're, you're going to redirect the grading towards the property um, or um, you know, as part of your construction, or you're going to have more impervious surface, for example, like a bigger roof area that kind of drains to your neighbor's property, um, storing that water and mitigating it, or doing some rain gardens or something that can hold some volume to decrease that, and, and then doing an analysis to make sure you're not directing a river um, towards your neighbor. So, you know, imagine if you started tearing down each older house, hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, big footprint. Um, so, you know, watching out for what you do on the adjacent property and mm -hmm. the drainage pattern is, is a way to... Um, Yeah, you, know, you just went on mute. Uh, I did. Now you're back, you're back yeah, now. We hear you now. Yep. Go, now you're muted. <laughs> Go off mute, Neil. Click it again, I think, one more time. There you go. Okay. There you go. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Sorry about that. All right. Well, well, yeah, I appreciate the, the response. We, we may want to have uh, further discussion with you as we, you know, we try and think through the, um, you know, the policy implications of the kinds of code provisions that we're thinking. Yeah. About. So, I mean, we'll write it down. We'll write, write it down. So we'll write it down and put it in the draft. And that would be a good time to, if you have some suggestions, email me and we can take a look at them. Okay. Thanks we're going to start wrapping things up. Um, I have a 
Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Susanna. Go ahead. Thanks. I just have a quick a question that um, are there, and I probably I may have missed it, so apologies. Uh, are there more global solutions than sort of um, house by house? Like, I mean, I I know you talked about cooperation between the houses that the the town could invest in you know, the sort of like, oh, you know, I, I live on Cumberland and in back of me, the water dumps down from Drummond and it's kind of a street issue. Is there something that that isn't just kind of house by house, neighbor by, you know, individual by individual that you've recommended and apologies if you've done that. So, no, I mean, that's a good question because, um, you know, if you wanna do something with public construction, then it starts to require things like easements, right? To go from property to property, it probably requires clearing, grading, some fairly substantial um, infrastructure, especially some inlets, some pipes. Um, believe it or not, you don't have a very extensive storm drain system through the city. And you know, once you start to do public construction, um, you know, things start with six you know, five or six zeros uh, behind the number. So it, it can be, it's a thousands of dollars starting costs um, just to do that kind of construction, even for smaller projects, um, because just that's the way public construction is done. Uh, I think it would be worth an effort to um, identify the problem areas and then work with the individual Home, we take that kind of attack because, um, it, especially in a community where people are kind of informed um, and have some interest, you know, if your backyard is wet and the people in back of you has a wet backyard, they're probably connect. The reasons probably, you know, there's some connectivity between them. Um, Maybe you, know, you, you both work on that issue. Yeah, Neil, I think. When, when Susanna's talking about something more global, I think a lot of us aren't envisioning a huge investment infrastructure, but more targeting um, certain areas within the town where um, uh, not a huge investment, but some investment could be made that would benefit multiple people. Um, right. So a, a way to maybe approach that would be, uh, uh, I think you've talked that you do, you are getting some ARPA money. Yes. All grants to homeowners in those areas where there are problem areas and direct those funds to doing things, some meaningful uh, improvements to the property. Um, for example, rainscapes, usually they want you to directly treat impervious areas but a lot of, it sounds like the drainage areas that are in the backyards don't have a lot of roof runoff going to them. They're just in areas that have saturated soils or that are wet, or you know maybe there should have been a swale constructed there when they built the houses originally, but you know this was pre-global pre, uh, warming and pre-before we had these huge storms, and that's why you're noticing it now. So... Um, that may be way I, an, an avenue to kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and just to follow up, uh, and then I, I recognize it's a whole other conversation. So, you know, when you're design, say you're starting from scratch and you're designing a community, you know, you do, you, you, you take all of this into account, you build water retention basins, you, you, you map it all out, right? And you would create an infrastructure that would, Mm -hmm. sort of stop, solve the problem before it starts. Right. Like, yeah. So sort of putting something on top. Of, so it would be these things like pipes or multiple house. I mean, I don't know what I'm talking about, but berms or swales or something that like. That's, that's okay. Don't know. There's a lot of people that don't know what they're talking about mm -hmm. when it comes to this. Um, so there might be a, for example, maybe every, if let's say the wet backyards are wet in five or six properties, yeah, get work with those homeowners, look at what's causing that problem. Is it the way that 
things are drained, maybe it needs some some minor earth movement, you know, just to swell things into an area. Maybe it can put some rain gardens in the back that are a little bit larger. Um, I saw when I went on the tour, people were diverting water away from problem areas, right? So maybe you work with your neighbor and you continue that diversion a little bit down away from both houses. So those are the types of things you could do on is retrofitting some properties. Neil, um, Ellen, if I can jump in very quickly, I really appreciate Susanna's question. And Neil, I think we've had this conversation since the beginning. I think it would be useful to get sort of these kinds of targeted recommendations given the level of sort of granularity we have. You know, so I'm thinking at the bottom of Cumberland, at the bottom of Dorset, when it abuts Little Falls, can we create a light, let's call it super light, so you don't put too many zeros behind it, um, you know, infrastructure that diverts water away from those properties. I think, I think we would be open to ideas along those lines so we can look at them, along with everything else you're saying, incentives and targeted uh, interventions at the homeowner level. So if there are things that, in Susanna's words, called global or holistic across multiple properties, I think it would be useful to get your sort of technical guidance on that. Um, originally, I'm just gonna jump in and then let Neil answer the question. When you want, I don't remember when we talked to you exactly and you showed us some slides and stuff of gutters, public gutters, I think in Hyattsville and stuff using impervious, um, <laughs> the good word, <laughs> pavers, and, and kind of like what uh, they're we're talking about is like some many things, maybe said at the bottom of the hill, at the top of the hill that the town could do in certain places where there's some public land or some place yeah. like that. So, so one of the things that I've kind of, uh, mostly the, my, have two or three people on my team go out and look, but the streets aren't causing your drainage issues in the back of your yards. The streets are actually acting as conveyance, right? Like, so the question is, you know, because I've seen this in communities around DC where the, so much water in the street that it starts backing up the inlets and houses are going underwater and cars are going underwater um, because the streets can't handle the water. But it doesn't seem to me, even though it's inconvenient and, you know, might be a couple of inches of water in the street, it doesn't seem like that street water is going into people's houses. So if it's me, I prioritize, because once you start doing street construction, it, it's just, it's expensive, right? And where do you want to put your bang to your buck? If you have people that are willing to do things on their property, and wells are okay to do it. Um, drainage is right. Um, I would recommend doing that, accomplishing that first. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm not against it, but I think as a group, you need to prioritize that because that, that, that can be a universal recommendation. Like you said, uh, Kavir, that you know you can have permeable streets, uh, pavements and stuff, and that reduces the water and it's good for the bay. But it seems that your issues are more individual properties and the fact that these properties are so tightly packed packed together. Yeah, we may we may want to take this offline. I think there's a middle middle path here. I think there's the extreme permeable streets. I love that. Right. And then, but there's sort of the next from the homeowner level is what we are thinking. It's one click beyond right. when it's multiple homes, it's a particular hot zone. It's sort of topographically favorable. Could we do something? And right. you, may, you may say no, and that's fine. We just want to know whether we can. <laughs> and we put the dollars behind it and then we think about how to go, go about doing it. You know, we just want all the options on the table. Yeah. So, uh, and and that's good to do that. Um, but I think I'm not trying to prejudice what my outcome, you know, or our recommendations would be. 
but I, I think that, you know, if, if, if the community is willing to spend public dollars on private land, right, which sometimes that's an issue, um, and it seems like there is some interest in doing that, I would say that's going to be more effective in this case because you know permeable gutters and stuff like that they're great for water quality they're great for reducing road runoff but and and there's a certain appeal to them but at the same time um if you could take that fund and that funding for that a couple of blocks and distribute that throughout the community um find that more effective for you Okay. Um, any, I, we thank you for being here for such a, a long discussion. I think very um, productive and thank you for your work. Um, any other last questions before we let these people go? <laughs> if not, thank you. Yeah, so so it's, very, it's very helpful because when you come into a community, um, I've been great at articulating the issues. So it's easier to come up with a solution um you know when you when you're uh, Ellen could I say one ask one question this sure. Is sure yeah on I would for example on lower door set when we were talking about something you know with multiple properties or I know on lower door set we get an enormous amount of water but we also have an advantage of the most of our properties on the north side of Dorset, the backyards, which take a tremendous amount of water in, have at least a 2% grade that goes to the front. And that's an example where if the water could be all directed to the front and it went to a permeable paver in a street, it would be an environmentally a good thing. And I know a lot of, a lot of our streets don't have that slope from the sort of the back to the front, but there are areas that do. And you know we couldn't hook we couldn't move our water into the storm sewer, uh, which, and I understand that they can't accommodate it. It would have been environmentally better because now we have to move our water to the sidewalk and street, and it travels a half a block before you know on the street with all the oil before it gets to a storm sewer. So, um, but that's just an example. I wonder if no. you find a cluster. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll look at that. Because I know we've targeted that area because I've had some discussions, but you know we're in a uh, a different different place than we were two years ago when we talked about how to what things are good like you know permeable pavements and things like that because we have upland flooding now that we didn't used to have um, and so many communities are making those choices like we'd like to help fix the bay but our basements are filling up with water, uh, you know, and that, that people have a different reaction and response than they did a couple of years back about this. Um, but it does seem like, I mean, we have a rain. No, that would be a good solution. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. had one of the first rain gardens put in. There's no way that rain garden is going to accommodate the water that runs down from above us, which is, I'm sure, many, many acres. Right. image and you know it helps but we have to capture the water and then direct it to right. the street direct it to the front and if everybody were doing that we wouldn't have so much to deal with mm -hmm. yes yeah so that's a good way to think of you know between lots maybe you have a rain garden and the water runs into that and you know it helps in the beginning of the storm it helps in a smaller cloudburst storm um, cisterns are also good for volume storage. So, so you know, like I said, people haven't just gone and taken the three or four grand out of the rainscapes program and just plopped and put conservation landscape. They've been very thoughtful and integrated into other things. It looks like. Mm -hmm. Neil, so this is a really practical question because um, I'm the note taker. So you said that you had sent the presentation to Matt. So is what you presented tonight exactly what Matt has? So I don't need to ask you for anything. Is that correct? Just to confirm. Uh, it should be the same. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks. 
but if not, I can, it just takes a second to send a PDF of it. And uh, like I said, it, uh, hopefully we'll get some good videos, but hopefully not 200 videos to take a look at. <laughs> well, we've asked people to be brief. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think uh, you're going to get that many. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That, that, that scared no. me a little bit. Yeah. I no. wanted to say thank you all for letting me join. I, Neil, I don't know. I, you might be able to stay on, but I have to jump off. But, um, no. um, I'm, just, I'm good. Okay. Send me a message if anyone has any further questions. Great. Thanks yeah. again. Thank you both so much all for right. all your work. All right. Thanks. So I'm sure you'll be hearing from, from some of you. And thanks. And I hope it was informative. And uh, very please, please uh, you know, if you have some questions, just send them. We'll 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 get to them. Okay. We're good Thank about you. That. Have Thank a nice you so have a nice evening. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, that was that was that was great. Um, one of the things I wanted to say, I know that we have a couple of council members on, and um, before we get into the. Um, uh, uh, rain gardens and more summary of, of uh, what we had the demonstration we had this um, weekend. One of the things, you know, as I walked around, there were a lot of drains and kind of pipes and people were talking about that they weren't sure whether they were county or they were um, town drains, in some cases broken um, pipes and drains have been put in prior to when people lived or purchase those houses. And so I was wondering whether the, um, the town had records as to who installed these um, drains and pipes and whether they were county installed or town installed or whatever, just so that we could try and figure out who might be responsible for them or if there was a mapping of them and to see what is already in place. Anybody know? <laughs> I don't know offhand. I mean, Matt Trollinger would be your contact there. Um, the town engineer may also have records of some of these pipes. That's that's basically where you'd look. Okay. I suspect it's mixed. You probably have it for some, not for others. If you want to write to Matt, why don't you? I did. I did write okay. to him. Okay. Yeah, okay. So recently, it wasn't that. like it was a long time, but I did ask him. I didn't know if he was going to be on or not, but this just happened this week. And so I was trying to get a handle on it. We're, we are trying to set up a meeting with. Um, the county commissioner to try and see about what things that our county drains, what they can do. Okay, so let's um, let's move on to the um, summary and uh, of the very, what I thought was incredibly um, positive, successful um, garden tour that we had, a rain garden tour and more this um, weekend. And I know a lot of you spent an awful lot of time lining up um, people to, uh, you, to, um, basically uh, showcase their yards. And um, I know Haya made these incredible maps and the participation seemed very, um, very good. Um, I just, I had said this in one of my emails. I think the highlight was my last um, yard I was visiting, which was Pages on um, Cumberland. And there was a couple there and I'd seen them several times at different locations. And so Paige said, you know, what, what is it that you're trying to do with your yard? They said, oh, we're at the top of the hill. We don't really have a problem, but now we're feeling really guilty about all our neighbors. So we came to kind of see what we could do. And, you know, that was very, you know, inspiring to me who um, is on the receiving end of a lot of the water that there are actual people on up at the top of the hill that are, are trying to um, you know, really help their, their downhill neighbors. And I think a lot of people just didn't know. Um, so I, I think that this was a good um, project. And I think some of the, the installations that I saw were just beautiful. And a lot of people think they're going to be unattractive. And I think by looking at them and you see that they're functional and they're, they're beautiful, even in this type of year, you know, kind of year with too much rain, we're in the fall, a lot of things are turning, um, they might not be as, as attractive. I thought it was very attractive. Anyway, so that's all I had to say. So Kaya, you wanna give us a summary of how many people yeah. we had and everything? I, I'm not sure that there's any way to, so I wish we had sign-in sheets because the problem is that we have numbers from each home, which may or may not, some of them are more accurate than others, but I don't know how many people went to all of the houses, you know what I mean? So 
I, <laughs> I don't have, well, yeah. Um, yeah, I did. But um, so uh, the, the range was from, I mean, Kathy, pick, is Kathy still here? Kathy first said a um, hundred, and then I was like, "Whoa, that doesn't sound right." And now she's saying about fifty, whereas Paige, who's right around the corner from her, said twenty to thirty. And people are we're having trouble counting. So I think the truth is somewhere in the middle of those, maybe because they probably got a lot. Paige has four four different things in her yard, and they both have rain gardens. Um, I don't know. It did seem like the first half of the tour. So. The, some of the highest numbers were the the Stellars who were stop number one had like 41 um, uh, and five. Marnie said she had 45 people. Um, Robin <laughs> reported that he only got 10 people at the town hall. That was kind of a lonely outpost. It was indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and one of those people was me and one of them was, two of them were my daughter and her friend. But anyway. I did appreciate um, the violin, but there wasn't one around. <laughs> <laughs> what did you? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, but it seems like people, you know. And the, the other nice thing is, it really was as people could see. Um, it was amazing that people were just together and walking down the streets together. It was a, just a nice kind of scene. And um, what was I going to say? Um, I don't. Uh, the one other thing is that people had different, much different stories about what was going on in their yard and why they did it and stuff. And one interesting one to me was Jeff Mascot who had the permeable patio. And it seems like they at one point doubled the size of their house and then they were having problems. So their patio was kind of built because of the problems coming off of their, their new roof, which was interesting. It was really their own doing, so to speak. And um, they didn't even apply to rainscapes. They just did it. You know, so, and I, I think it's partly because they just wanted to do it, but I'm just saying there's all kinds of different stories out there. Um, and, oh, some of them are very impressive. I don't know how many of you all went to different ones, but some people had video, were showing videos. Uh, one, uh, the Stellars, number one, had like a display, like on a mural with pictures of, of their whole process. So they really went all out. It was, it was very nicely done. And I was very happy because all we did was like pick some houses and make the maps and d distribute them. Thanks to everyone who distributed them. That was a lot of work. Um, I just want to ask if anyone else has any highlight. I mean, I'm supposed to give a, uh, what do you call it? An article to the journal about this. And I don't know if there's any specific things. I mean, I know what I would say, but are there any other things that you guys would think I should say? Besides um, I, adding I, a lot of pictures. Jeez. I was just uh, interested. Um, we had about 45. I think we were kind of the Stellars and Marnie and stuff were all close, but there were um, quite a few whole families came with kids and just it was just fun. The kids actually asked questions and were interested in um, wh where the rain came from, where did it go, talking about the animals. I mean, it was just it was very fun. It was kind of if if nothing, if nothing storm watery comes from it. I just felt, you know, the, the just it was fun to see the kids and everybody um, just be interested in these issues. I, I, I thought it, there were a lot of unintended outcomes, positive and community building and stuff that I saw. Yeah, no, I thought there was definitely community building. One of the guys I dropped a leaflet, he was outside of actually a P ER doctor, a pediatrician, but anyway, doctor, um, he said, oh, I'm definitely gonna bring my kids to this. So I think it was both educational for adults and children, and then definitely community building. And, you know, I called it sort of adult trick-or-treating in reverse or something like that. You know, we all went around to different houses and took information, not candy, obviously. Uh, Marnie right. had a handout in terms of the other, the different ways people, you know, manifested their activities. I thought that was pretty, really great too. Oh yeah, um, Marnie had a handout. I didn't get to her house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and uh, I should see that. I, I need a copy of that. Yeah, no, I think I think people seem very pleased to uh, you know be engaged with it. So kudos to your uh, subcommittee. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I just wanted to add that um, the Kana resident Christian Kana had um, a feature that wasn't even listed, which is, and, and I don't know if people saw this. There was conservation landscaping, permeable driveway. We mention those things. They also had a permeable pathway, wow. which um, as you may recall in the um, discussions of code changes, we talked about pathways a little bit and been concerned that if we did anything requiring permeability, we might um, create some problems with 
surfaces that people could trip on or whatever. And I thought their example was very instructive because um, it was very attractive. Kristen said it was very, very effective. They had a dry well next to part of it to take excess runoff off the pathway. But she also said uh, her, her husband is disabled and he has, there's no problem that they've encountered with the walkway being something that, you know, a surface that people could walk over. And it's not completely level. It has um, permeable pavers that are very small and square and then gravel surrounding them. Um, and since the mascots were the only ones that we found any permeable surfaces that were other than, than driveways, this is really something else that I think if, if the pathway issue ever comes up, we have something to point to as feasible in some cases, maybe not all, but some cases. Yeah. And I think I another issue, oh, sorry, the, another issue we had mentioned was concern about, you know, talking about uh, patios similarly, I think, yeah, you know, yeah. oh, you know, are they attractive? What do they look like? And so I thought the mascots was great and there was an enormous uh, dry well under it, evidently, right? Oh, so right, right. Massive yeah. diameter, right? Um, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, to our issue about, you know, how much people are going to want to do those things. I mean, we have real examples that are really attractive and super yeah. effective, but, you know, to your point, Julie, so. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, we're going to move along here and get a, just kind of get a, some updates from the various um, subcommittees, um, uh, rules and regs. Ed? Is he still here? Yeah, um, no particular update other than um, two things that I've been working on. I did um, add some text to the, the draft final report. I also saw, in a doing so, I saw quite a bit of uh, text in there. It looks like others have been contributing as well. And I've also been working on the table of um, uh, putting in table form the various provisions from the different codes that, that we've identified. That's in the works. Um, I wish I could say I was closer, but uh, progress that has been made. I, we've also been delinquent in having a subcommittee meeting, which I'd hoped to do before this meeting. We didn't, I, I couldn't pull it together, um, but hopefully in the next week or so, um, we'll plan that. Maybe, maybe for next week, I'll reach out to everyone and hopefully we can all get together. Okay. And um, does anyone else from the subcommittee um, have anything specific to report? Nothing? Okay. Not in any. Okay. Um, yeah, let's try and get that a little more because we're getting to the point where we're going to have to finalize recommendations. So, um, and then maybe uh, you can talk talk to Neil a little bit too and kind of see where you all can coordinate. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. I, I consider the whip to have been cracked. Okay. <laughs> okay. Resources. Oh, that's me, isn't it? Yeah. Um, no, we problem. had this thing on Sunday. Uh, <laughs> I, we, I don't know that we did anything else. Uh, and is there anything that you're trying to do before we start finalizing the report? Any other um, areas of? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, no, which no, we just need to put our stuff in the report, some of the okay. resources, yeah. Um, and Julie Abrams, did you wanna say anything about trees? Yeah, super briefly. Um, so, um, we're, we had talked about you know, daisy chaining with the um, Parks and Natural Resources Committee since they had drafted code. As you all know, um, that committee was fairly dormant. I know um, their uh, Kristen Kana of the uh, well, famous walkway um, uh, is talking to, to uh, that maybe you, Kabir, or someone else. On, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, someone on the council to sort of resuscitate or revitalize the committee. The and committee actually, is resuscitated. Oh, it has been. It's already. alive. Okay. It's alive and kicking. And it's alive. Okay. And there's already a document on potential direction for fixing the tree code, and they would love to coordinate with you if you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, she and I have been in touch. So yeah, she gave me that, and I just need to look at it actually this weekend, and then I want to get input from our committee, the Stormwater. It's really focused on being kind of more strict, both about when you reforest and you know with the threshold of one or two trees versus three, 
um, and then what one does. So it's a bit different than what we'd envision, but we feel, you know, we definitely don't want to have code that's different from their code. That would really make no sense at all. So really regarding trees, and she and I agreed that trees are sort of a sub, not a sub, one component of stormwater, whereas it's really primary for what they're doing. But, you know, that said, she's very open to our feedback. So I actually just need to look at it because it's not quite what I was envisioning about, you know, some what we would do for stormwater specifically. So I'll be getting back to you all for, you know, input and feedback on that. Um, and uh, yeah, go forward with that. So, and, and I think so, Ed, in terms of the code, so this is very specific to trees. And I think, you know, there'll be other aspects of code that we'll be talking about with that rules and regs committee, obviously subcommittee. Um, so it's, it, it, I think it would be a different sections of the code, but I think we want to show, you know, this is more coordinated where they're, they're the lead and we're working coordinated with them. Whereas, you know, some of the code we're talking about in for this group on different topics will be, you know, our lead. Um, so just, but just so that we're sort of presenting, there's more than one area of code that we may be addressing um, on different topics. So great. Um, yeah. well, anyway. Multi-dimensional. Yeah, exactly. You know, Julie, I would mention Please. it's always you know good to coordinate, but from a council perspective, it would be fine to get different proposals. Oh, that's interesting. You know, okay. You know, because it'd be good to sort of understand things right. from different angles. So okay. don't feel in the in the process of compromising, let's not lose right. our good ideas. Okay, no, that's actually really helpful because so we had a tree subcommittee as you know one of our various stormwater committees, and we're coming up with kind of the natural result of what we were seeing, but that's somewhat different than what they had come out, you know, from which their, is fine, their own. Which is fine. Okay, yeah, so they they are, you we know, can talk about yeah. that. Yeah. And yeah. also for process, it's the October working session. Oh, is it already scheduled? That they are, yeah, um, you know, we have a working session and then we have a council meeting. Right. So sometime mid-October is a, or late October is a working session. And okay. their rough plan was to try and bring it in, as for discussion with the council. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Without any designs on where it goes from there. Just Right. Do you know the date of that? Or I can check with Matt if you don't know. That's fine. 18th, 19th, okay. 20th. One, okay. one that's fine. That's fine. God, I've got it on my calendar somewhere. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then in terms of, so that's the code. And then in terms of, you know, we've done the trees. I don't want to call it database. It's a glorified spreadsheet. But anyway, all the tree removals. So we stopped at the point where we reported you guys. I've been collecting town journals, which is our source of information, believe it or not, um, for that. So I can update it so that it's, you know, up to date. So it has the most recent over the last, I guess, three months or something. Um, again, you know, that's the what's been removed. And of course, there's the broader issue if we want to recommend um, that there be some kind of tree inventory, either some kind of, you know, no pun intended grassroots where, you know, we get different people to literally, you know, enumerators of trees, or if we, you know, hire a firm or whatever. But, you know, we can, Ellen, if you want, I can just add to that. It'll just so that we have it up to date when we do the report, you know, just basically be, you know, X number of months more if that's helpful. I don't know if that's helpful or not. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, cool. Um, uh, the consultant mapping committee, um, Julie, Julie G. Is Julie still on? Yeah, yeah. Well, wasn't that Neil's report? <laughs> Isn't he there of that for me? <laughs> See, oh. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, one of the, the questions I have now, when are, I mean, I'm just trying to, um, I think in terms of our timing and his timing, um, in, ter in terms of our recommendations and reports, uh, his report is going to be finalized and, and submitted when? Does anybody know? Um, At no, the council, he said end of October. So end of October, okay. But I would, I, I would, you know, with all things, multiply by three is my usual philosophy. So it'll, it'll probably take a few more weeks past that is what I suspect. So it'd be helpful as we're as we're sort of writing our report to have, you know, his sort of his information as well. One of the questions that I had about the mapping as I look at that map um, are all the areas where people never filled out anything, and it really bothers me. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't bother anybody else, but it does kind of bother me. I mean, I know we can't. You know, and I do know a lot of people wanted to fill them out and miss the deadline, and then we couldn't accept anymore because the thing was closed. And I'm just, you know, not trying to make more work for all of us, but I mean, we have sort of a, a database being built, and I'm just wondering 
whether it makes any sense to take any kind of crack at um, the folks who um, did not um, fill out the, the survey. I mean, I do work, get concerned about, you know, the data. It's, you know, there may be pockets that are varying stages of severe water issues, no water issues that we just don't know because there was no reporting. So, I mean, right. I was on the subcommittee and the subcommittee did a ton of work, I know, but I'd be definitely in favor of, you know, doing a sweep to try to get that because otherwise, I, you know, I don't, I'm never clear how accurate our final answer. I'm thinking, can't, can't we ask Neil to take our, with, with the GIS, all the information that he's gathered? Wouldn't, wouldn't maybe some of that um, highlight some, some of the areas? Right. Yeah, I guess ultimately, um, I think that I, I, as I understand it, and I could be completely incorrect, I thought they were going to kind of combine both the, um, you know, the, the stu our study and then the geographical study, rain, you know, whatever, um, together. Um, is that the, um, anybody else's? Well, look, since, since, since he's got the addresses, you could combine those two databases. Actually, be kind of interesting to see if there's some correlation between residents' responses and what he has in his database. I don't know if that would change any decision we'd make. And so that's my question about the second sweep of houses who did not respond to the survey. Is there something that's missing that would change our recommendations if we had those additional houses, we got about 50% of the houses to respond, a little over 50%. Would it change our recommendations if we got 20% more? Or do we kind of have a sense of the perspective of the community from the response we got? Well, I think the areas that I was thinking about is where you have what looks like a cluster and then you have you know, three or four houses that didn't fill it out. And then you have another cluster and you don't know what's going on in between those two clusters. If they didn't fill it out, they just didn't fill it out. Whether they didn't know, they didn't do it. They don't have problems or they do have problems. It would be, I think, especially if we're looking for larger areas that we can identify and then have some kind of impact. If, if, you know, we know these people, we know the, you know, people know the neighbors. I think if you've got water in your property, you're having issues. Um, you know, I know, I know, in fact, across on Dorset, some of the people didn't fill out have really big problems. They just missed the deadline and they didn't do it. So I would argue against doing any more input of information unless it's actually deemed relevant based on priorities. We are, we don't have enough bandwidth or funding probably to um, you know, do a comprehensive analysis of every drainage area in the town. So if we have some sense that there are certain drainage areas that are really problematic and we don't have critical information that's needed to actually come up with a plan to cope with the problem and propose it to the homeowners and say, this is what we think is gonna work. If we don't have the information for that because we have missing information about two homes that are sort of at the heart of that drainage area. And we're not really sure just quite how bad the problem is. Theoretically, there should be a, there should be a problem. We don't know if there is one. Then I think we go to those people and say, well, you know, we're contemplating this project here. We think this is an important project, but we would really help to know more about your situation. It, otherwise, to get that information, if we don't think it's a priority area, I don't know what it what. That yeah, that's exactly I, that's I, exactly what I'm talking about. Are the areas that you suspect because you know there's a hill and everybody you know the last four houses have have issues and you know, in, in some cases above the hill have, have issues. And then all of a sudden there's just, there's an unknown information going on there. And um, I think it's helpful to know, you know, where is the water coming from and what's the impact? And it may just be a yard situation that isn't bothering anybody, but then flowing into other people's um, yards, or maybe they're, you know, people who just have perpetually wet yards and they can't grow anything, but they just thought that's it. And I have to say, I ran into a lot of people like that, where they just said, this is sort of the state of my yard um, in kind of- Ellen, 
I'm, hopelessness. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just wondering, is it helpful to ask Neil if it would be useful yeah, I to think complete so. the data? Yeah. Maybe we start there because it's kind of an evolution, right? The survey was the first step. Now yeah. Neil is doing this analysis. Actually, to Brian and Jan's point, there seems to be a correlation. And from the preliminary data we are getting, it seems to be overlapping. And his analysis takes the survey further. So it might be worth just asking him, will it help? And to your point, Ellen, I do think, I mean, we didn't do it, for instance, because we missed the deadline. I do think now is you have sort of a degree of heightened awareness and interest in this issue. This is probably the best time to get people to respond. So if there is a need, now might be a good time to try and fill that, yeah. fill that gap. It, uh, yeah. Yeah, a couple, of, a couple of points uh, maybe I could make uh, before the end. Um, Neil did use your survey in his presentation. I don't know if you were aware. <laughs> did you see it? Yeah, no, I could tell by the colors. <laughs> I saw Ellen's <laughs> hard work. Did you tell? Survey, <laughs> and he sees it as very useful information. So um, you could certainly ask him if more detail would be helpful, but he already sees it as very helpful. Yeah. Okay. So know that. Yeah. Um, the other point is it's really just a council report. Uh, the ordinance that you guys sent us, which was modified a little bit in council debate, but not very much, is going to be voted on in, at a November meeting. And we're trying to actually put it into the consent agenda. I mean, obviously, if anybody objects, it'll go into the full agenda. But no council member has raised objections to it. So we hope Great. to get it straight into the consent agenda and through uh, that way. Sorry, Robin, can you just be specific which what will be uh, submitted for that? No, I'm okay. sorry, because I've taken the notes. It's <laughs> the one where uh, 2.6 inch is uh, one, in, one year storm uh, uh, should be covered from the roof area um, with uh, mitigation plans. Um, and it also includes uh, pervious pavers in the driveway. It also includes um, having uh, an early presentation of the plans. Um, okay, are, are the what we wrote up earlier? Yeah, yeah. Okay, exactly. exactly. Thank we, you. I apologize. We already, we already. I remember that document. Okay. We already introduced introduced the ordinance. This came okay. out of a subset of us meeting in person. I think Ellen was on the phone, if I remember. So it's effectively that, and then other homework we did. We already introduced it, but then we missed the thirty day. You know, it's, it's introduced for 30 days and then you, you have to pass. We missed that. So we reintroduce it. It's the fault of Labor Day, actually. Yeah, so we are, just for that, you know, Jeffrey is very strict about these things. So just for that, we, will, we are reintroducing it, but it's on the consent agenda because there's no debate. We already approved it. So it just is on that agenda. And then we will stick to the 30 day. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, um, is there anything? I think that's it. I think we've gone through every, everybody, right? Every committee, I think so. Yeah, and um, when do you need all the comments in the document, the master other than yesterday? What is the date? Oh, oh, I, I'm sorry. That is one of the things we want to talk about was the, was the draft report. Yeah. So um, Julie's kind of the person who's been maintaining it and people have been putting comments and, and everything into it. So I think we've got to wait until Neil's thing's done, right? To kind of finish up that portion of it. So Julie, when do you want to have um, all the, the first draft written? Well, as I, I think I said last um, meeting, my feeling is that there's a whole front section that is information that we have already sort of uh, digested and used as a foundation for what will come at the end and our recommendations and the rationale for recommendations. And so I really think I, I haven't checked it recently. I think there are several sections that need to be added to that and they should be added now. Okay. Does um, everybody know who those I, I'd say are? Or do they need to be called out? 
I'd say in the next week, it would be really good to have those sections done. And I can't list them right now, but I could send an email out tomorrow that says, here are the sections that where we haven't fleshed out this back, it's all background information. And uh, uh, you know, let's just say a week. Um, and then that leaves things about, you know, that's uh, consolidating information, recommendations, providing the full, you know, uh, you know, the, that part that, that's at the end. Obviously, we do have to wait until um, we get Neil's report. We have the rules and regs committee do its comprehensive proposal for, you know, not just what happens to um, ensure we have the minimum number of waivers of storm of um, sediment control permits, but what are we doing about every type of construction that adds impervious surface or that reconfigures it or whatever. And that we still have to, we have, a, we, we have something, that's a pretty big chunk to worry about. So this, this other stuff, the background, we really need to get in place. Okay, do you wanna say um, October 6th? Sure, and I'll send out tomorrow. Email. These are the pieces that get are every To get everything and then, um, um, and you got our, uh, our committees, draft the the um brian's, the brian's yeah, yeah yeah i put that in the survey okay ago, yeah. and we yeah. have the deadline so it's two weekends not just the one weekend for those of us that time was i know i owe the climate impact of climate change in the front section i know that i owe you yeah um what, i'm sorry what are you asking julie oh so if the deadline can be after the second weekend not just this one weekend because some of us can that's the only time okay so you're talking about like the 11th yeah okay October. Okay, that's it. And that's the drop. That is it. Great. Okay, that's the deadline. Okay, everybody got it. Okay, thank you so much. I think it was a great week. I think we're making some progress here. Hope everybody feels good about it. Yep. Excellent. All righty. All right. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye.